In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and blessed the fruit of thy Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for Saint Joseph. Pray for Father and Terry. Saint Ignatius, all God's angels and saints, and the fathers. I welcome you all to our Ignatian Forum, and we got uh, two of our well-known celebrities here. We can use that term, <laughs> Mary and Annette. Not Hollywood celebrities, but Ignatian celebrities. Okay, that's even better, isn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, you read through the Diary of Saint Faustina. We're going to be reading. We almost read almost every day at three o'clock. Is um, we haven't arrived at it yet, but Jesus suggest, he encourages Saint Faustina to make novenas. We are brought up and raised with novenas. You know, Saint Anthony, Saint Jude, you know. and uh, I think the modern um, the modern culture is kind of uh, forgotten the importance of novena. So uh, we're right now as oblates, we're making novena. In many ways, uh, after doing the mass, we pray the novena to Saint Joseph. By the way, uh, in my talks in the morning, Spanish and English, I'm making novena. Um, in the evening holy hour, we're making novena. In uh, this uh, forum, we're making novena. So. We're kind of going novena crazy in honor of Saint Joseph. No? Yes, we are. Um, both of you have, um, you know, elephant memories. You probably remember in great detail what I talked about two days ago, and as well as uh, yesterday, introducing Saint Joseph. I spoke about uh, a little bit of theology. I used the uh, word. Um, Latria, hyperdelia, protodelia, right? And delia. St. Joseph is the first in veneration. Then there's another title, and it's um, St. Joseph, uh, the, I mentioned St. Joseph, the Terror of Demons. Terror of Demons. And um, the next time both of you participate in a formal exorcism, I'd like you to maybe pay more attention that the priest invokes the name of Jesus, the name of Mary, the name of St. Michael, the name of St. Ben, and the name of St. Joseph. He's known as the Terror of Demons. And they mentioned that plaque up there in, Cal in, the, uh, in Canada where you have the orator of St. Joseph. You see this man tempted by devils, and St. Joseph comes and they and they recoil terror-stricken at the, at the person of St. Joseph. So, if you're tempted, don't toy with the temptation, but pray through it by invoking St. Joseph. You know, about um, 12 days ago, I celebrated my birthday. And I got a lot of gifts. So I thought, it's kind of interesting, I got a lot of gifts. And I was looking through my room, I was able to kind of reorganize my room, getting some bigger bookshelves, so I'm able to have my books in order. You know, I, I feel I made a huge, a huge step in the right direction. I can eat, at least, I, at least I can look at my books and know where they are. The next huge triumph should be to be able to read those books. If someone comes in my room, they're going to think I'm a scholar. <laughs> all those books, right? I mean, Father Broom, you probably read all those books four or five times in different languages. Well, let's, I'm not going to comment on that, but let's talk about literature. <laughs> One of the ways to get to know St. Joseph is through the, me, through, um, the litany of St. Joseph. Litany of St. Joseph, you have these 
Litanic expressions, which are like a condensation, a condensation of a virtue of St. Joseph. What is a proverb? It's a condensation of wisdom that's been tried and true during the course of years. That's a good definition of a proverb. Yeah? I thought you liked that, Mary. Hmm. So one of the, um, one of the uh, litanic expressions, and there's more than one litany of St. Joseph, and both of you have somewhat of a poetic flair to your, to your nature. If this was a gift that was given to me for my birthday, can I show it to you? You like that? Yeah. You like it? I do, but it's on the other side. The picture. Now, uh, I'm, I brought this purposely. It's a to, Christmas ornament. <laughs> well, well, this I, I purposely brought it because one of the one of the phrases of St. Joseph, the people usually pray through and not really think about it, but it's always struck me because I like, I like language, and he's, he's known as uh, the ornament of domestic life. What is this? Ornament. It's an ornament. No? Um, when you were brought up and raised, uh, uh, we would get a Christmas tree. But many people today get it right, you know, right after Thanksgiving. We would get it like the, right the week before Christmas, and sometimes a couple of days before Christmas. I always love Christmas trees. Um, for several reasons, one is that I, I like the smell of uh, uh, fresh pine. I like pine wood, no? And uh, I would even, when I play baseball, there'd be a pine t uh, pine tar that you use to be able to grip the bat well. Did you use that when you played baseball? Okay. Oh, oh, okay. But I like the smell. Even when when you're ah, when you're when you're cleaning when you're cleaning the bathroom, there's a certain pine tar smell that can be used to to basically lift up the dirt. But the Christmas tree, we would find a place to set it up. We get a place where you could put water in it. Let me ask you a question. If you had a Christmas tree and Christmas arrived and you went through the Christmas tree, Christmas season, and that Christmas tree did not have any or ornamentation, would you would that be complete? Oh. Why not? But part of the Christmas season is you decorate it. On the top there will often be a star. And then you decorate it usually with bulbs, Christmas bulbs. This is a biggie. Mm -hmm. And it's John Paul II, oh. his papal emblem. Oh. And it has His Holiness Pope John Paul II, 1978 to 2005. And given that you, you read Polish, don't you? Oh, it's Japanese. Oh, Polish, okay. You have it in, in Polish, okay? Uh. So the person gave this to me was probably, who knows, it could have been a, a Polish descent, but it's a very ornate, beautiful, Christmas decoration, and it's a it's a Christmas bulb. What does it mean? Saint Joseph is the he's the ornament of the domestic life. You see, neither of you have ever thought about that, but it's worth reflecting upon. <clears throat> and it means this: the Christmas tree without the ornamentation, something wrong. Once it's decorated with lights and the star and the ornaments and the bulbs, it can be very beautiful. So what I think what the church is saying is that if you have a home in which St. Joseph is missing, it's like a Christmas tree without the ornamentation. What do you think? I agree. Mm -hmm. So in our homes, we want to invite... Jesus, Mary, but also St. Joseph. He is, the, he is the ornament of the domestic life. And the nature of an ornament is it embellishes, it beautifies, mm -hmm. it shines. We don't want a dull, drab, anemic house all doing, no? 
he wanted a lot of zest. So having St. Joseph, even though he's a very humble person, humble, he will give, he will give a certain ornamentation, beauty, and fragrance to our domestic life, our family life. So all families should have a beautiful image of St. Joseph. A statue, a painting, an icon, whatever it might be. And even with us now, we've got the Novena Prayer, but even behind us, we have the beautiful image of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So this happens to be the year of St. Joseph, right? Yes. So that is um, our, our, our Novena uh, talk today. Can I let them see? Yes, could you do it? Don't throw it like a baseball because no, it's pretty fragile. Very careful. So don't don't squash it. Yeah, no. <laughs> so beautiful, beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. <clears throat> might even turn around there. You have the papal emblem. And you might even turn it to the right or left. And you have the pontificate. That's the Polish. The other on the other side would be the English. Most people probably don't know Polish except you and Annette. Very beautiful. You're not going to toss it to me, are you? No, Father. I thought you were going to say, Father, you know baseball. Here, take. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so that's kind of a long intro, but uh, would you like to say something about St. Joseph before we enter into our topic? Or? Oh. Do you have to watch the St. Joseph? I do. I actually have a statue of the, the Holy Family in my house Wonderful. that I, I really, really like. Yeah. Um, and I have a small statue, like about that tall, in my, in my prayer, prayer room. Yes, uh -huh, where I pray. And a lot of images of him. Especially like the one where, um, it's the one you have in your studio with... Oh. Um, with St. Joseph in his workshop with a baby Jesus, a toddler, toddler Jesus playing with the nails. Oh, that one. I love that image. So I have a little one of that in my that little prayer you? room. What does that say to you? I think it's a beautiful image, isn't it? Um, he's, uh, well, it shows him as a worker, St. Yeah. Joseph the worker. And he's, uh, he's like always there with our Lord there, contemplating him. And it's, our Lord's playing with nails, so it's like our Lord is, um, it's like a, a hint at his coming passion. Yes, mm -hmm. good interpretation. And uh, St. Joseph is there, there with him, supporting him in that. Yes. And he's working hard, and the nail is pretty big, isn't it? Yes, it's yeah. huge. It's yeah, yeah. huge, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, Mary, would you like to say a word on St. Joseph? I was blessed a number of years ago. I was given a beautiful statue of St. Joseph, and, and it's, it's even, it's, it's, it's at least as tall as the one we have here. And, um, but it's actually a little bit larger. It's not painted, you know, so it's, it's in a, a, a sculptured color. But, um, but it's very beautiful, and, he, and he's on my dining room table because he's the man of the house. He's the master of the house. He's the, the, the protector of the home. And so, um, uh, I'm I'm always very comforted to have that, you know. And then and I I told you I have a bulletin board in front of my on the wall in front of where I work, and and I have a, an image of Saint Joseph, so I can talk to him when I want to, or ask him to help me, or for favors, or just to tell him I love him. And yeah. Great. So the topic we're going to be talking about today is an extension of what we talked about yesterday. We we're talking about the cross. And I think I mentioned the different dimensions of the cross, the cross of related suffering. There can be physical crosses, there can be social, there can be cultural, there can be uh, there can be economic, there can be family, there can be a lot of different dimensions. And I mentioned that um, the only cross that we're responsible for is the moral cross, in which we suffer because of our sins. And um, that happens to be the truth. The other cross that they come from they come from God, and uh, we were talk I was talking with Father Larry and the other, and Father Dave at the at the lunch uh, a few minutes ago. And we were talking about the city of God of Saint Augustine, which he talks about suffering. He says that everyone has to suffer, whether or not you whether you want it or not. But it uh, there's a difference between suffering as a pagan and suffering as a Christian. 
So we introduced the topic of uh, of the cross, um, and so I thought we'd talk about um, the stations of the cross. I'd like to mention one and comment on it, then we'll open up the door to uh, both of your uh, your contribution. First station is Pontius Pilate, who condemns Jesus to death. We haven't, we've talked about this station, because we've never talked about this first station yet, so I thought I would maybe introduce that to our forum. Now, I see Pontius Pilate is indicative, I think, of a lot of people today. You know why? Is because Pontius Pilate, either we are people pleasers or God pleasers. Either we are people pleasers or God pleasers. How often it happens in our life that we we have a tendency to cater to public opinion or cater to wanting to be liked. Wanting to be liked by friends, family members, colleagues, even church members, and sometimes we're, we're even tempted to lower our standards so that we will not be, we will not be maybe rejected by others. So it's really easy to fall under that. I call it the, the Pontius Pilate syndrome. That he knew that Jesus was innocent. His wife Claud Claudia had a dream. And you see this in the movie of Mel Gibson. She had a dream and she said, nothing, have nothing to do that with that innocent man. He heard, he heard his wife and he knew his wife was telling the truth. But what did he do? This is very common today. He buckled under... Um, public opinion. Because outside there were these rabble-rousers that were crying out, if you do not condemn this man, you're, you're not a friend of Caesar. So he preferred to please the crowd rather than to do what was pleasing to God. How many times in our lives have we maybe because of fear, because of prudence of the flesh, because of a desire to please another person. How many times have we maybe lowered our standards and we become people pleasers more than God pleasers? I'll give you a classical example. The 1500s. King Henry VIII, Henry VIII. It's basically only bi only one bishop that decided to be a, a God pleaser over a people pleaser. His name was John Fisher. We today we call him Saint John Fisher, the English martyr. All the others, the clergy and the bishops, they wanted to be a people pleaser pleasing King Herod rather than to risk their lives. That's pretty common today. How often do parents maybe they prefer to give in to their teenagers their whims rather than to fight with their kids. Right? Better just to give in. I'll let you know, let my daughter wear that that dress, which is really provocative. I don't want to fight with her. I'm, I'm just too tired. But sometimes you got to fight even when you're tired, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I think we can really see the person of Pilate. How often in, in, in politics, because of expediency, we'll, we can easily compromise the truth because we want to be, we want to be liked. 
And you know, when all is said and done, I think we have to try to please God. If you try to please the multitude, you're going to have half with you and half against you anyway. <clears throat> so I think we have to make a concerted effort not to be a Pontius pilot. Be more like John the Baptist. Same thing. King Herod, everyone, everyone knew that Herod was living in an adulterous, incestual relationship. But no one had the courage to confront him except John the Baptist. What did he say? It's not right for you to live with that woman. He didn't beat her on the bush, did he? He died the martyr's death, but he's one of the greatest saints in the Catholic Church because he was not a complacent people pleaser. Any comments? I thought of something else in the, in the Bible about um, there's that incident of Su Susanna in the garden, oh, yeah. and those two men are um, are attacking her, and she it's written in there that she has she makes a decision. She says, "Shall I give in to you, to to those two men that are attacking her, or shall I not? And and then I will I will be obedient to God." It says, I'd rather be obedient to God than to give in to you and to be pu be punished by men rather than be punished by wow. God. Good example. That's what came to mind. Yes. And she was, uh, she was framed by these two elders. That they, they almost had her condemned to death and then God did raise up Daniel. And Daniel actually defended her and those two elder, elders who really calumniated her for having, they said that she had relations with them, and there was a young man that he, he should have relations with, and he ran off. So they really called, talk about character assassination, but she, de she depended upon God, didn't she? Even Joseph was seduced by the wife of a pharaoh, right? He was thrown in jail, but he was, as a result, he was given the highest position in the kingdom after pharaoh. So we should always try to do God's will, right? I was thinking of um, of the Old Testament. I was thinking, is it Eleazar, the the man, the old man that um, that refused to um, pretend to eat the um, meat of the idols' sacrifice, and uh, but not really eat it, but he would be giving bad example. And in his old age, he said, "In my old age, after all these years, should I now give bad example?" And, and all the young people would lose their faith. And also the mother with seven sons and encouraging each one, you know, do not let me have the sorrow of knowing you will not be with me in the life hereafter. You know, do not give me that sorrow. And she preferred to watch each of her, she watched each of her sons die in very, um, very cruel deaths and then herself died. But rather than um, deny, deny the truth and deny the faith that she was brought up in and that she believed in the Yahweh that she loved. Well, we're going to talk. We're talking that. That's my. That's the station of the cross that really seemed to impress me. Is the whole um, the first station? Pontius Pilate condemns Jesus to death, and he washes his hands. But really, he's washing his not so much washing his hands, but he's not assuming the responsibility of setting a an innocent man free. Of these fourteen stations, is the one that seems to touch you most? Of the fourteen stations. Well, I was thinking about the um, the sixth station. Uh, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus, and I was thinking about um, how people's names or their faces can be smeared by um, by words of other people, and instead of like when when you hear of somebody saying something bad about someone. Instead of going along with it, trying to do something nice about that person, um, trying to help that person, like so to speak, save face. So, so um, to honor the person rather than than um, have that person thought of as being less than. I mean, like ruining the reputation. Right. So that's the station that touched me today. Oh, that's very good. 
Mary, how about you? Well, one of my favorite stations is um, is uh, Jesus meets his mother, and uh, for so many reasons, the um, the tenderness of mother and son, and um, you know, as a, as a mother, um, I would rather be with my son or daughter who is suffering than to be away. I couldn't imagine being away. Um, it, it would be more suffering to be away than to be there suffering with them. And the son knew that the mother loved him so much that she, she had to suffer with him, that she couldn't not be there. And that gave Jesus comfort. So I love the comfort that was exchanged between mother and son. The other thing I love is, um, and I'm sure a father would do that too. I'm sure a father would, would, would not abandon his children, you know, in their need. Um, so um, the other thing that I love is that, um, is Mary's strength. And um, Mary stood at the foot of the cross, stop at Mater. But um, and that strength is exhibited when she meets Jesus, you know, carrying his cross. It's a strength that she had all the way through. And I've often thought how, um, as Christians, you know, we need to have strength. And we don't, we don't look for persecution, but we need to stand strong in the face of persecution. And, and there's times where we'll be persecuted now because we have a, we have a government that is um, antithetical to um, Christian beliefs and Christian values. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to experience persecutions of different kind, and we need to be strong. Um, the other thing is, um, I remember when, um, uh, a few years ago, when I, I, for the first time in my life, I, was, I had to live alone. I had never lived alone in my entire life. I went for my family, then I was in college, I had a roommate, and I got married. And you know what my attitude was? It's nobody's fault that I'm living alone. How come I don't know how to live alone? I should know how to live alone. Why, why can't I live alone? How come I, why, why, why am I so intimidated by this? That's not anyone else's fault. That's my fault. I should be able to live alone. I should be able to stand on my own. And that's how Mary was. She lost Joseph. She lost Joseph. But, and Jesus went off to do his work, and she lived alone. And, she, and so I think all of us need to have that strength within us to, to um, stand up, be the person God created to us, be man or woman, and, and live fully our life, whatever our situation, but with, with the strength of Jesus and Mary to guide us and, and to, to give us that strength. Very good, yes. I remember reading something in literature um, years ago that said that um, you can be surrounded by a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot, I'm not saying a lot, a few, and you can be experiencing a crushing loneliness Whereas you can be by yourself and experiencing just an incredible consolation. Is that, and I think it all, de it all depends upon one thing. Can I tell you? Whether or not God is your companion or he's not your companion. Because if you're, if you, you're living in an apartment or a condo or a house um, by yourself, if you have God with you, and what I was trying to point out in confirmation that you were with me the past three days, is that if you have God as your companion. Once you're baptized, you're a son of God. Jesus is your older brother. The Holy Spirit is your best friend. Then you have the angels and saints in heaven as your companion. You're really not alone. You're really not alone. But rather, you're, you're, you're sharing your life with the, with the blessed trinity, the angels and saints. I don't think there's any better companions than them. Or so maybe, you're, say for example, 
and I, it might be the case with our Facebook family, we'll, we'll pray for you, is, um, and I might be the culprit of this, speaking somewhat facetiously, once I get you people to do the exercises, you, you're not the same person. Did you notice the difference? Yeah. You're not the same person, whereas, say for example, you're, you're married and you got maybe three young adults that are living there in the house. There's a radical change in you, but you're, maybe your husband and you, the three young adults, they're the same. It's not going to be the same. And you really can't I, I, I can't, I don't think you can be lowering your standards. Once you're aware of the fact that the universe will call the whole and you're called to become a saint, I don't think it's right to return to a mediocre lifestyle. Uh, return to the status quo and just be a normal person. You're making a holy hour, a rosary, two rosaries. Don't be a fanatic. Just be a normal person. Calm down and enjoy life. You know, you got one life to live. Enjoy life. As the waitresses would you say before the pandemic, you sit down, enjoy, right? That's what they, I guess they're taught to say that now, right? Enjoy, no? So, um, there's a difference between I think the author was saying in this, there's a difference between, you like language, don't you? Difference between being alone and loneliness. Is it the same thing or is there something different? So, in a certain sense, what you're saying is, I don't. Uh, it, it could be a real blessing in disguise. Because you've got the best of you get the best of two worlds, right? Yeah, you know, my mother lost my dad four years ago, and uh, most the, most of that time she she she's she by herself. She's uh, alone, but I wouldn't say lonely because almost all of her life is just she says she's always talking to God, so. Um, I think that's a very important concept. There is a difference between loneliness, a crushing loneliness, and being alone. Would you like to comment on that, Mary? Would you agree with that? You know, God, we've talked about God permits evil to bring a greater good. And so being alone is, most people prefer not to be alone. They love human company and human, you know, companionship, but um, the blessing has been that I, I do talk to, to God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, to St. Joseph. I'm still getting more familiar with St. Joseph because he's kind of the last one that I've become familiar with. Our Blessed Mother, the angels and saints, and um, uh, more and more saints I, I'm talking to, and I put their picture up on different ones now I'm getting more familiar with, but they're because they're real people, they're really they're more alive than I am, and and they hear me, they listen to me, they can help me so much, they can comfort me, and it's it's just it's just joyful. My home is joyful, and um, so I'm going to share an anecdote. And this, when you think about it, this is take, taking what we talk about here and taking it to another setting. So I had a, a friend who, a couple in the last couple of years, had a very very serious surgery, and she was very afraid and. Um, so um, I was talking to her like every night, like a few days before, and I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to invite, who's your favorite? Who's your patron saint? All right, we're going to invite Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. All right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. But who are your, fa your guardian angel? Who's your favorite saint? So she started naming her favorite saints. Okay, we're going to invite them to be in the, in the operating room. And then we started adding, we kept adding saints, and we kept adding the archangels and the, and, um, and the powers and dominions. And I, pretty soon we had all of heaven in that operating room with her. And we were talking on the phone. This was the night before. We were laughing, and we were talking, and we were inviting all of them. And I said, boy, that operating room is going to be crowded tomorrow. I hope the doctor can get his elbow room to do the work. And you know, she went in there and she said, Mary, she talked to me on the gurney as they were taking her in and she said, I have total peace and that room's going to be fill filled with people who love me and are praying for me. 
And it's all the saints and angels in heaven and the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So those, our heavenly family becomes real to us. And so um, I have this, I still have that image in, in my mind. And I think, okay, when I'm dying, I, I'm starting to invite all the different angels and saints and saying, why does everybody come, okay? <laughs> let's, let's kick the, you know, kick the, the devil in the, in the duff. <laughs> Well, Annette, um, what would you like to say about what we're talking about now, the way of the cross and this conversation on a very important topic? What would you like to add to this conversation? I was thinking about um, being lonely and being alone. Um, an experience of, of both, if I can think of um, being alone, is like you're talking about the change after taking the spiritual exercises, and being in my, the, um, with all my relatives who who were, were not particularly um, religious or practicing the faith. Um, I felt that sense of aloneness, you know, being in that room with them. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, um, after thinking about it, I thought, wait a minute. It's like, um, but, but God is with me. God is with me. Um, and, and I, and I thought about, I thought about St. St. Therese because she writes in her book that she couldn't make friends as a, a little girl and she'd go to school and, um, for some reason, she said uh, she had trouble. She was always alone, and um, she was complaining, kind of like um, not complaining, but she was thinking about that. And um, she she got the inspiration that this was because our Lord wanted her a deeper relationship with her, because she had a tendency to to really f um, love her friends, and she would become very attached to her friends. Um, and God was allowing that so that so that she could have a closer relationship with with Him, with the Lord. Um, so I thought about that in, in the when I was alone, with, when I was feeling lonely in with my relatives, and it brought me a sense of consolation. Like, okay, I'm not alone. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> yes, it is. So. Yes. What about uh, St. Therese, Teresa of Avila, Elizabeth of Trinity? They speak, uh, especially Elizabeth of the Trinity speaks about the, the divine indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in the soul. What do you think about that? I think that's beautiful. I mean, by, by our baptism, um, the Holy Spirit, you know, comes in, the, the Holy Trinity comes into our soul. And as long as we're in the state of grace, they're there with us. And uh, that's that's the Carmelite spirituality, right? Yes. Um, so we're never alone. They're always there. We can we can speak to them, um, and in the silence, we can listen to them also. In our in our if, if we can remain silent. We were talking about silence the other day, I remember. Um, so we are never alone, even if physically we, we're by ourselves. But um, spiritually, the, the Holy Trinity is there with us. And yeah, well, what more can we ask for, right? What, like you say, what better company? The Holy Trinity. Mary, how does God speak to you? Well, he, he speaks to me through um, other people, through you, through the exercises, through the priests. Um, he speaks to me um, through um, my family, um, family relationships. He speaks to me through friends. But, um, but in, my, in, my interior, in my interior life, um, the Holy Spirit has become very... Um, 
I've I've learned to to wait for the Holy Spirit to to, to guide me, and I've learned that um, if a situation comes up and I it's like I can do one thing or another, go one way or another way, I'll pause and I'll just wait. Because before I used to try and figure out in my mind what should I do, and I try to think it out, and usually I just get a headache <laughs> and I still don't know what I should do. But I, now I just pause and I wait, and and then pretty soon I have a prompting to go one way or the other, to do one thing or another. And, um, and I've, I've come to learn that's the, actually, that's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So, so it's, I'm just more comfortable if I'm not sure, just waiting until I have some clarity. And, um, and the Holy Spirit's always right there. And um, sometimes our Blessed Mother, sometimes our Blessed Mother is nudging me or urging me, and I'm, I'm aware of that. I, she, it's a different touch. She has a different touch with me than the Holy Spirit. So I'm aware of that. Um, so uh, the... The other thought I have is, in some sense, everyone is alone. Everyone really is alone. Because all of us know somewhere deep inside us that there's, there's a place that nobody knows us, nobody understands us. We don't even completely understand ourselves. And there, there is that existential loneliness. And that existential means part of our existence is there's that aloneness because there isn't anyone that can fully understand us and love us and, and receive us, except the God that, who created us. So those of us who believe in God, who um, ha- can come and receive Jesus in Holy Communion, who can um, pray the rosary with our Blessed Mother, who know the angels and saints and can talk to them, and talk to and the Father, the Father, Jesus says the Father, where the Father, where the Son is, the Father is, the Father comes and dwells in you. All through, all through um, John, when he talks about the vine and the branches, it's always the Father and the Jesus come together, you know, if, if, if we're connected to to God, then, then they both come into us, and then the Holy Spirit, of course, prompts us. So um, that what we're talking about is the interior life of, of, of God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we are the children of God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created to know them, love them, and serve them, be with them forever in heaven. That little, little verse we learned in first grade, that is really our total existence, and that's where we're totally known, totally loved, totally fulfilled, and everything in this life is going to be short of that. And once we understand that and we can turn to God immediately and begin that relationship to grow deeper here, we have more fulfillment and then we can enjoy whatever friendships we have with, at whatever level with other people because we're not seeking something they can't give. Does that make sense? We're not looking for that anymore. We're just enjoying people for who they are. And there's a great freedom in that because really my, my real source is, is the Trinity within me, living within me and uh, growing within me. And um, it's a beautiful... How blessed we are to be Catholic. No religion has the fullness of faith that we do. Um, not even close, and even even our Protestant brothers and sisters don't have the fullness that we're talking about now. Um, how blessed we are. Well, thank you for that wonderful sharing. And given that today we have the Way of the Cross in the church, uh, at um, we have the Chapel of Divine Mercy at 3 o'clock, then we have the Way of the Cross shortly after that. I really uh, thank you very much for your sharing. Very beautiful sharing. So I'd like to, um, let's just say Hail Mary, that we'll all um, just grow in our love for God. Because the gospel today is very beautiful. The love We're called to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbors, ourselves. And who better than Joseph and Mary for this grace? So let's say the Hail Mary, and I'll give you my priestly blessing. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Joseph, the Lord be with you. Through the intercession of St. Joseph, God's angels and saints, St. Ignatius, may God bless you in a very special way today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.